This is the Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer brand and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. Ken Himmel is the CEO of Related Urban, which is the famed developer behind the Time Warner Center and Hudson Yards, which opened recently this year. The interesting thing about Ken is that he is equal parts real estate guy as well as operator. He owns and operates uh, 15 restaurants. And I think that really differentiates him in this world of real estate and retail because he really sees both sides of the table and really acts accordingly. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him for 20 years nearly. And there's a lot you can learn from Ken Hemmel. So stick around. Ken, thank you so much for doing the safari. Happy to be here this morning. No, oh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. As one of uh, someone who I consider a mentor, it's just really fun to have uh, some time quietly to, to chat and, uh, and get together and talk about all the things that we have sp spoken about for uh, at least 20 years, I think, at this years. point. <laughs> so I, I love the fact you've got a photo of Marvin up here on the wall. Yeah. That's inspiring to start the Yeah, discussion. there we go. You know, he, yeah. he's gonna, uh, we better do a good job, right? So, you know, I've often felt about uh, you that you are a um, sort of a, a merchant real estate developer. You know, you have that left and right brain, which is such a unique talent, I think. And this notion of uh, the, the merchant developer as well, uh, the idea that you actually care deeply about uh, the products and the consumers. And uh, talk a little bit about your philosophy first, because you have um, been doing this for decades and you're one of the probably most well-known mixed-use developers anywhere on the planet. But there's a secret source to it that you might not find to be rocket science, but to many, it's kind of different. Mm. Probably it starts with uh, my background, right? So coming out of uh, graduate school at the hotel school at Cornell. So it's about hospitality to begin with, which ironically enough, when you look at the world today, think about this for a moment. You know, who's running Hudson Bay, Sachs? Who's running Bloomingdale's to Cornell Hotel School graduates? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm obviously not running the retail side of the business, but obviously I'm very involved. Uh, but coming out of that hospitality background has always set me up to care deeply about my mix of programming in the projects, which doesn't always start with traditional retail or department stores, even when department stores were popular, mm -hmm. but started actually with hospitality products. So I began with hotels in my projects. I began with, as an example, in Chicago at the uh, Peninsula Hotel on Michigan Avenue. And then what did I do? I put Tiffany's and Ralph Lauren at the base with other retailers. Um, even at Copley Place in Boston, right? I started with a Weston and a Marriott Convention Hotel across from Prudential Center mm -hmm. and then added Neiman Marcus to the mix along with other retail. So hospitality has always been a va major part of it. And of course, you, when you move from hotels, you immediately go to restaurants, which has been a passion of mine since I was a young kid. I've always dreamed of being in the restaurant business. Um, never really wanted to be the operator, but I love the creative part of the mm -hmm. business. Uh, I love creating different concepts. And Though you are an operator. In well, I, I am. <laughs> exactly. I, you, don't, you don't always choose to be the operator, but sometimes de facto you become the operator. How many restaurants do you have? I'm involved now either in owning completely or joint venturing and managing about 15 restaurants at the moment. So you're an operator. Yeah, it's gone a long way. <laughs> um, but that, that actually is a, is a very critical part of how you put these projects together. It's, it's funny, this morning I was working out this morning and I had the news on, so I saw this whole 10-minute gig on American Dream yes. over in Jersey, right? And it's like somebody thinks they've discovered something. You know, it's an amusement park. Um, at some point, they're going to add retail to the mix. But it's all about trying to provide some entertainment programming for people. My choice, my, my program of choice for entertainment 
you know, has always begun with the hotel and restaurant industry. And if you think about it, you can provide people with such a wide variety of program options in food and beverage, it's almost unlimited. And, uh, you know, Hudson Yards probably speaks to that the best of all the things we've done. So now, you know, when you get to the merchandising parts of the project, which is critical in any kind of a shopping center, uh, notice I never use the word mall. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I've known that. I've been, I've been yeah, reprimanded been in the, the past. anti-mall guy, <laughs> uh, which I've been for, you know, 40 years. But, I, you know, today, uh, and your firm, I mean, you and Kelsey um, have been very involved with us in trying to explore, you know, new brands, new ideas, online retailing. But you still have to begin with a traditional basis of retail. And, you know, the, the myth or the most misunderstood part of this business today, I think, is the perception that people have that the whole world is shopping online and that for some reason people have just are just beginning to write off department stores and beginning to write off any kind of traditional retail, which is very far from what really will happen over the next 10 to 20 years. But it is changing dramatically. It's a whole different world today. Um, you guys are going to actually get a little presentation from me today before I leave on our Santa Clara project in the middle of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, that project is going to be, you know, a whole new world of how you put all this together. Well, can you spend a little, maybe spend a minute to describe what that is? Well, how's it, how's it new and how's it a whole new world? For, for one thing, it's the first project I've done in 20 years that isn't seven levels or six levels of retail. Huh. And so, wow, what a breath of fresh air. I, I say to everyone in my mind, I mean, Hudson Yards is the last one of these vertical mothers I'm doing. It's just too difficult. Yeah. And, uh, but that doesn't mean it isn't working because it is working. It's working very well. But Silicon Valley is 240 acres of land, not 20 acres of land. It's 13 million square feet of development, and it's a city. I mean, what's missing south of San Francisco is a city. Nobody's ever built a downtown. It's full of a couple of major malls. It's full of uh, lifestyle centers, but no one's ever really built a city. And so we've taken eight years to get the approvals for the project. We've got all 13 million approved, and uh, we'll be breaking ground on the project uh, this, this uh, summer. So it's, it's all ground-level retail, and the ground-level retail forms the basis of every single mixed-use block in the project. Two major hotels, a 480-key Conrad Hotel will be our, our flagship mm -hmm. convention hotel, an Equinox Hotel, no surprise. Yeah. Um, entertainment program. You know some people there. And we, we partner with everybody there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and major entertainment program. I, I, I should also say every single project, that I've ever done in the last 40 years has also been either anchored directly by us or anchored because it's in the immediate zone of a cultural program. So whether it's Back Bay Boston with uh, all of the music centers that are around us or the Boston Public Library, which is a major, major center, or Time Warner Center, right, at Columbus Circle next to Lincoln Center mm -hmm. and with Jazz at Lincoln Center, integral to the project. And then look at Hudson Yards, right? We've got the shed. Mm -hmm. And we've got the High Line, and we've got the Vessel. So it's, uh, it's, it's finding ways to really put unique programming together. Um, but again, and also fundamental, incredibly great planning, incredibly great public realm design, and great architecture. So when you, when you wrap all that up, I think you use a term that is placemaking. And uh, our late, dearly departed uh, Howard Elkis and you really just started every project thinking about uh, placemaking and what that word meant to both of you. And let's spend a second remembering uh, Howard and, and, and how, that, how his philosophy as well uh, guided you in, in everything that you did. Ironically enough, I was just having dinner on uh, Tuesday night at my new club, the Wine Spectator Club here in New York at Hudson Yards. And I had dinner with uh, my long, long time closest attorney friend, Nina Matis, who was so close to Howard, and which she basically did all of our legal work on all of our projects. So we lived together, all of us. Howard was a very rare human being, just as Marvin was a very rare human being. Matter of fact, Marvin and, and Howard were obviously dear friends. Howard had that rare combination of he was an architect, he was an engineer, he was an interior designer, and he was an artist. Mm. And when I say all of that combined, literally, we could take a project and Howard could sit with me at dinner and we would sketch all night. 
and through a dinner, many times restaurants weren't happy because he ran out of paper and was using the <laughs> tablecloths. But but literally, he would really take the vision and and test the vision and move it in all d- different directions with me on programming. And literally, he would sketch out solutions right there with me, which is something that's, of course, a very rare talent. Yeah, I remember uh, being rare. with him and you all over the Middle East, and he would run up to people in, in the most conservative of countries in the Middle East. I remember being in Saudi Arabia, and you know, people are very private and conservative and covered. Uh, the women off, uh, had been then at that point. And he would run up to people and say, hey, wh- what do you like about this mall? <laughs> and he would exactly. get inspiration out, out of everybody and everything, the most, the most curious and wonderful human being. And so, you know, coming back to this, this what I'm now sort of calling retail hospitality. Mm-hmm. You know, Marvin obviously famously was all about retail theater, uh, which is obviously people in the whole industry tried to to mimic, and I think maybe it's become a little generic at times. But this notion of the morphing of hospitality and retail, and retailers, as you just alluded to, uh, two major CEOs in retailing coming out of hospitality. But it's 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 not, it's more than that now, isn't it? I mean, mm-hmm. it's about it's about the the place making, the environment, the 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 need to be in an, in a place is something that the hotel industry has really, it's all, it's all about that. There's nothing oh, yeah, different. Yeah. So how do you get people to want to be there for something, some reason other than the product right. you're selling? Right. It, right? It's almost as if the, the retail, the drive to convert uh, traffic, to convert into sales becomes secondary to what is it that's bringing your best customer there. Best example in today's world, at least that I'm living with, is Hudson Yards. Mm-hmm. Because getting the wealthy serious shopper from the Upper East Side and from Midtown East Side and from Upper West Side to move past their traditional shopping habits, Mm -hmm. all the best on Madison and Fifth, and to get them to actually experience something like Hudson Yards is primarily driven by the restaurants, um, is driven by the shed, a cultural facility. And, uh, And that gets them there in many cases for the very first time. And they wouldn't come otherwise Mm -hmm. in many cases. But when they come... They suddenly, their eyes open up because on the fifth floor and the sixth and seventh floor is probably the most beautiful Neiman Marcus store anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. They just didn't have any idea it was there. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So talking about convergence because, you know, uh, retailing and hospitality, but also real estate developing and operating. We touched on it earlier, but related um, is a a rare animal. I think around the world, actually, you're seeing developers following suit uh, Mm. in, in Canada, uh, in the Middle East um, and, and in the Far East, people realizing, you know, maybe we should get into operating or buying or investing in companies. But, you know, Related has um, invested in uh, and then even bought uh, companies uh, that f- might serve the greater purpose of the, you know, the mm-hmm. amplification of the podium. Right. Equinox is an example of one of the first instances which led to SoulCycle and Rumble and other things like that. Um, and now Equinox Hotels. Of course, yeah. So yeah. T- talk a little bit about that evolution, how you know, mm. Steve Frost, who's obviously incredibly talented in this area, uh, who's your partner, um, how he you know, felt and how he had this trigger and, and what led to where you are today in that regard, in that sort of morphing of real estate and strategic investments and, and uh, operating platforms. So, so ironically enough, it all began when I got a phone call Let's see, 1997, uh, so 22 years ago. Um, and the call was to come down and join him in trying to compete to win Time Warner Center at Columbus Circle, which we were very late in the game. Uh, matter of fact, there were eight other bidders. We were the ninth bidder. All the traditional names that you'd expect, Trump, uh, Tishman Spire, Vernado, Boston Properties, uh, Gerald Hines, so all the major you know, New York and international developers. Mm -hmm. And we put together a scheme and we won the scheme because of obviously Stevens gravitas and experience and reputation here in New York, but he really hadn't done much by way of retail, especially vertical and hadn't done much by way of cultural and hadn't done much by way of restaurants and uh, really hadn't done any hotels. Mm -hmm. So I teamed up with him and uh, the, the kind of connect the dots was Howard. And Howard and David Childs from Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill all got together, and it was one of those very rare chemistries where all that unique programming, and at the end of the day, adding jazz at Lincoln Center and not trying to place it on the ground level of the project Mm. where everybody else would have tried to do it, 
placing it at the top of the project and making it an anchor that would draw you up. So anyway, that that was the beginning of my Steve Ross relationship. And by the way, that relationship began with his actually saying to me, there are two areas that he was really very concerned about, not wanting to get over overly aggressive in terms of risk. One was hotels, mm. and the second was restaurants. Fast forward 23 years <laughs> later. <laughs> you, you've, you've had him well exposed to that. <laughs> He's bought into the game. <laughs> and, the, and the real answer is, if you look at the way traditional, especially mall developers, have conducted their business over the last 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, whatever, um, and it's evolved, but they really, most of them try to put the programming together by absolutely minimizing the risk, mm -hmm. whether it's a hotel and whether it's restaurants, entertainment, whatever it is, minimizing the risk because they're in almost a single silo business. They're, if they're public or private, um, they're judged on the basis of their retail performance. Mm -hmm. So they're very, very opposed to, in many cases, very uh, wary of moving into mixed use because they get dinged for it because they don't have the expertise. And you know what happens because you've seen this firsthand with me. What happens when you try to joint venture one of these major components in a mixed, pro mixed use project with someone and you're not part of that organization? Most of the time it doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. So what, what Steve Ross did for me and with me was, you know, both had the resources and had the guts to really say, let's be sure we're getting the right programming and the right players and in almost every single case, that means you've got to co-invest. In some cases, like in the case of a Thomas Keller restaurant, like Per Se and Bouchon and now Tack Room, mm. we are the most significant investor. So you really have to partner. But the talent in many of these businesses doesn't have the business acumen, don't have the resources to actually be able to take this on like a true triple net lease tenant. And so that's where, this, that's where we actually excel. That's where our projects can actually deliver unique programming that no one else really either has the experience, the guts, or the resources to do. Mm -hmm. So now, add to that, uh, February of this past year, I just brought on uh, Ron Parker, who was the former COO of Union Square Hospitality Group, mm -hmm. Danny Meyer's organization, yep. 15 years. So there is a really good example. Now we've set up something called Related Restaurant Group, RRG. Now we're in a position where we're not only... We're not only leasing space, where as a landlord, we're investing tenant allowance money. Mm. We're doing joint ventures where we put in more than tenant Is allowance Jose Andres money. one of those? Yes. And uh, Jose Andres, Thomas Keller, Michael Lamonico. Um, you know, we can go on. We're about to do a deal with Fabio Trabocchi from Washington, D.C. So we're, we're launching um, that business with an eye towards in Santa Clara. There'll be probably 20. Well, in Santa Clara, there's a 150,000 foot global food marketplace. So think of Covent Garden on steroids in a timber building, 85 feet high, uh, $200 million building that's full of 50 food venues and five restaurants. We'll be doing deals with Milo's. We'll be doing deals with Michael Lamonico. So we're bringing, and we'll be doing deals with lots of people from Napa and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be in the business of willing to invest. Mm -hmm. and Taking some risk. Yep. And so right now, beyond the restaurant businesses, t tell us a bit more about Equinox, obviously, going back to uh, Time Warner Center, you put in, a, I, think, I think it was a 40,000 square foot mm -hmm. Equinox. Right. And you and Harvey Spiegelberg had healthy uh, negotiations about that and mm -hmm. uh, putting that in there. And then you also did uh, probably what became sort of the go-to gold standard uh, Whole Foods setup. I right. think it's probably one of the most productive in the country, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But that 40,000 foot Equinox uh, led to you realizing <laughs> how powerful it was to get these repeat visitors every day who are coming to the gym, not to mention all the other elements. How do you see it today and on such a different scale? When, when, when I talk about the uh, Hudson Yards situation, when you, everyone loves to talk about, yes, the, uh, the shed, and then, yes, there's the most Instagrammed uh, building in New York uh, right now, probably, which is the vessel, the vessel which yeah. everyone climbs up. But there's also the observation deck, which actually is accessed through the retail, you know, and yeah. I, I think that's probably going to be one of the most visited tour. I mean, all the rest of it's great, but being able to see the rest of New York and every single other major landmark from your center, from the roof there, probably the highest in the city, actually, highest I in think. The city, yeah. I mean, that's going to, th th those sort of different elements all converging in one environment have to be uh, just a machine of, of traffic. I mean, you must be overwhelmed with traffic. Well, by the way, obviously, 
all this didn't happen by accident. I mean, these are planned years and years in advance. And uh, so, and, and also it's not an accident that the 2.7 million square foot tower where Time Warner's, all of its divisions are headquartered, KKR's headquarters now moves from 9 West 57th, Wells Fargo Private Wealth goes into that building and then Related goes into that building. So the building's 100% occupied as of next summer, next fall. Mm-hmm. And that traffic, by the way, moves in and out of the project on both the fourth and fifth levels. We designed double-deck elevators. So when you get on an elevator on the fourth floor, there's also a cab above you on the fifth floor. Mm. And you can get into the project on level four if you're going to the pure observation deck level 100. You can go to the fifth level and get onto an elevator by going through a beautiful lounge, cocktail lounge, a great bar scene, and get on that elevator and go up to the restaurant, bar, and private events facility. So we're expecting about 3 million people a year uh, to go in and out of this facility. And also, on that 2.7 million square foot building on the fifth level is the office entry and exit going into the retail. Yeah. And one of those office buildings, I remember someone telling me recently, 75% of the occupants are women which is quite rare for a building like that. Probably the, the high, highest penetration, because I guess it's L'Oreal and Coach. and uh, <laughs> That's the South Tower. Yeah. So yeah. 30, 30 Hudson Yards is uh, Time Warner and Wells Fargo and KKR. The South Tower is actually made up of Tapestry and Boston Consulting Group. But listen, listen, I mean, it's remarkable. And you and I have a very interesting example where this didn't work very well in a, in a place we didn't control the mix of uses, which was in Abu Dhabi where four office buildings got built, and five years after the project opened, the office buildings weren't even 50% occupied. This project at Hudson Yards... Imagine how well the retail would have done had that been had open. Been <laughs> so, I mean, H- Hudson Yards, we've already delivered over 10 million square feet of leasing in the project. We'll be right back. I want to take a second to explain to you why Traub is able to bring you the safari. We pride ourselves in being at the very center of a very global, very complicated consumer and retail landscape. And in our travels, as we help think, manage, and expand businesses in many different channels and geographies, we're able to meet and learn from some of the great minds in this industry. And it's really wonderful to be able to bring them to you. And in doing so, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to learn a little bit more about what we do at Traub as well. Back to the safari. And so, you know, related and everything going on at Hudson Yards, it's really become the sort of the pinnacle of all of your activities, I believe. I've heard from all the brands and we've obviously been very involved with helping sort of bring together and coach, I think is the word I would use, many of the mm-hmm. digital native brands as to how to open some of their first stores ever uh, within uh, your, your walls. Um, all of whom were very cautious and I would say even petrified uh, to open retail and uh, frankly, their first store ever with you. Um, they all are way overperforming. I've heard also in, in, from many of the luxury brands that they are too. But there's always this sort of mixed reviews on how things are going. And I'm, I'm based on all my uh, independent uh, views and knowledge, know that it's doing very well. But t- talk about, you know, whether it's traffic or sales right, or right. statistics on that, because let's put that to rest. Well, you probably never put it to total rest, right? Because there's always the naysayers who think they understand what's going on, but they don't really have the facts. The, the facts are that we're taking an average on a low day, 45 to 50,000 people a day through the project. Mm-hmm. On a busy weekend day, and certainly during these busy holiday seasons, that number goes up to 75 to 80,000 people a day, which is right dead on with the kind of projections we had. We thought we'd be between 15 and 20 million people going through the project. And we, every single lease of 250 leases in this project, every single one has a percentage clause, which means every single tenant must report their sales to us each month and certify them, Mm. either as a public company or their CFO has to certify them. And then we audit everything. So Mm. I'm, I'm not guessing when I talk about this. (laughs) And, And actually I get a report every single month. Literally it's on a very long sheet of paper and it has, it has a I've bar. Seen those, yeah. It has bars which go to the right, and the bars on the top right. We take it by the sales per square foot; those who are performing at the top, mm-hmm. and then we move down to those who are performing at the lowest. Mm-hmm. Green is good, 
And green means that someone's performing in excess of 1,500 a foot on annualized sales. They're on that path. And by the way, when we report now for October, November, December, we've been open since March. So it's not just a two or three month opening trend. We're now looking at nine months of actual. And I can tell you that 80% of the chart is green, which means tenants are in health ratios that are very healthy. For, for the most part, those are tenants that will be doing between $1,200 and $5,000 a foot. Mm-hmm. Predictably, as you would guess, the 5000 a foot is on the first level in the categories of jewelry mm-hmm. and jewelry and accessories. But remarkably, and I can't tell you, I, obviously I can't use real numbers here with Neiman's, but I can tell you that at the moment, we expect to finish our first 12 months, and they do about 25% above plan. Mm-hmm. And, and the plan was very respectable. The plan, if we'd met the plan for Neiman's, it would have been in one of the top 12 stores in the country which means if they hit their numbers, it looks like they'll be well within that top 10. So the business today is, as you said, you know, varied in, in many parts of the country. Uh, you're, you even related is also in Europe. And, and, and I, I'd love to understand sort of some of the things that you are seeing coming down the pike in, yes, your business, but also uh, when you, you always are always looking at the consumer and the things that they are looking for. Um, where are you seeing uh, change and flux and, and how are you sort of chasing the puck a little differently than maybe mm. you have in the, over the last 10 years? Very differently. I think the, uh, and, and again, I'm going to use Santa Clara as the best example because we, you know, I've been on this for eight years getting it approved. In the last 24 months, as it looked very positive that we were going to get the approvals, it became quite real. I mean, today we don't own the land. It's a ground lease with the city of Santa Clara. So when I tell you a number, we have over $125 million invested in the project, and we haven't started construction, and we don't own the land. Hmm. So you can imagine how much of that money has gone into design, planning, um, conceptualizing, and visualizing, and market research. A lot of money has gone into market research and testing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So uh, I-, I look at Silicon Valley, and I look at this project. Now, by the way, here's this incredible city called San Francisco, which is just north of us. But San Francisco, like a lot of cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, a a lot of cities are having a a tough go of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of issues, right? A lot Mm -hmm. of issues with poverty, uh, a lot of issues with crime and security. And and yet the demand factor for these cities has never been higher. Meaning you look at New York and you look at San Francisco, you look at Boston, you look at Chicago. I mean, people want to live in these cities. So, you know, I won't get off on the tangent of dealing with the politics of all this, but it's a shame that we can't get the political side of our, uh, of this whole equation to be in concert with the demand side of it, Mm -hmm. because the demands there, they're just not, they're not providing the services that people need. Mm -hmm. So, but what does that do for us in a city like Santa Clara, California, where we have a tremendous relationship, very positive relationship with the mayor and commissioners. I mean, they're tremendously supportive of what we're doing. We, we, we will develop a platform which literally will be, totally responsive to the demand side of the equation. And so it's, you know, what, what is that menu? What is the canvas that you're painting? And uh, I mean, it's, it's unlimited. I mean, yeah, particularly for you. I mean, you're, you're used to East coast stuff and obviously you've done projects overseas, but a Californian um, shops differently, same thing. Yeah, what, what's the deal? Look at the demographics in a place like Silicon Valley, the first, the age, right? I mean, we're typical, our typical customers, you know, averages 45 to 50. Now we're talking about an average age of 32 to 38. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at buying power and buying habits, very different. Dress, very different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, the luxury shopper, very different. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but you're dealing with, you know, 30, 40 different cultures. I mean, people who populate this area come from all over the world. By the way, imagine what that does for us on the food side of it, the food mm-hmm. and beverage side of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, we will have restaurants from, you know, from Vietnamese to Chinese to I mean, we're, we'll cover the world, uh, which is fun. That, that really makes it interesting. But it, it, it sets out a different challenge. Plus, you're in a part of the world where people expect innovation. Um, they demand it. And so I have a relationship. I can't name the firm yet, but I will be able to. One of the world's largest consulting firms, maybe the world's largest. Um, this is an interesting story, which you'll appreciate. I'm on an airplane. We won't hold that against. (laughs) (laughs) I'm on an airplane coming back from uh, San Francisco. I'm going to Washington, D.C. to visit my kids and grandkids for a weekend. I sit down up front on an airplane on United Airlines, and I was on the plane for about 15 minutes, 
I pulled out of my briefcase my foster design materials because I was going through all of the latest plans and critiquing all the work we'd just done. So I've got this. In, by the way, Norman Foster's office is doing the bulk of the work for us in, mm-hmm. in Silicon Valley, all the guys that do all the Apple flagship stores. Mm-hmm. So I pull out this material, and, of course, the guy sitting next to me couldn't wait more than a moment before he said, my God, what is that? Anyway, that led to a four-and-a-half-hour dialogue. I never stopped talking to this man for four-and-a-half hours. He went through every page of about 250 pages worth of work with me. Got off the airplane. He called me a week later. We're now engaged in a very serious effort where they're providing huge consulting help to us in the areas of technology and innovation. Hmm. So that's just an example of, of all of a sudden, we're now, a lot of our programming in this particular case will be by, driven by a lot of the input we're going to have with this firm. So let's talk a little bit about from, from the technology to sort of the rotational uh, element of having retail that can be dynamic and changing. You've always used a term, you know, remote merchandising unit or RMU, to have you know, these smaller units within, um, within the, the main general flow mm. of the malls or the, or the shopping centers. Um, and, you know, to me, that's always sort of been, in, in, in another parlance, a pop-up uh, environment. Mm. But having spaces that can change, that can morph, um, and uh, you've done some of this at, at Hudson Yards, but how, how do you see, uh, whether, whether it's uh, event space, changing space, uh, dynamic space, how, presumably out in Santa Clara, you're going to do some of that? Oh, a lot of it. And, and we have zones in the project in Santa Clara because we're spread over there's actually the downtown is about 100 acres of land and the core 50 acre core center of the project provides us with an opportunity to do about, I'd say 550 to 600,000 feet of street level retailing and restaurants, including that global food marketplace. But we'll have zones of the project where quite literally, because we can provide attractive economics, Mm. you know, the heart of the project, the rents are at the highest because that's the highest traffic areas, Mm. but we can actually go to, I'll, I'll call it a, a secondary street, but it certainly isn't secondary in terms of traffic. But we're able to provide economics to people. As an example, you're in a part of the world that everyone likes to talk about driverless cars. Mm. And everyone likes to think that you don't have to build parking. But it's a part of the world that today still 90% of the people drive to your project, right? So you have to provide parking. What we've done is we've organized our parking garages to be what's called flat plate parking with high floor-to-floor heights. So at some point, we can convert it to an office or residential use when parking demand goes down. But at the beginning of the project, all of the ground level of these projects is retail and food and beverage. You don't know that you're walking around a parking garage. That area of the project has very attractive economics, and that's where we expect to have a lot of our innovative young retailers. So what are your friends in Silicon Valley saying about whether it's an if or a when on on self-driving cars? Because obviously, if that does happen, the shift in real estate values in dense urban centers and uh, and maybe there could be even a, a renewed exodus to the suburbs where people could be driving themselves in uh, from from the suburbs. Do you, what are they? What's the any intel on that? I I don't know any more than you really do. Even though we're in dialogue with the Teslas of the world, you know, a company called Lucid Motors. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, I was just with uh, them in their headquarters uh, two weeks ago. I mean, they're all into this. I, I, I'm doing a lot of work with Daimler, so Mercedes, as an example, which is trying very hard to innovate all over the world. They're all predicting. It's sort of like looking at online sales, right? It's like looking at e-commerce. You know it's it's got legs. It's going to take hold. But even today, when you and I ask people what they think, the the velocity and the percentage of sales are online, most people say 40 or 50%. Mm. And you and I both know it's still under 10%, mm. but it's growing at exponential rates. So 10 years from today, it'll be 25%. I think that's the same kind of phenomenon with self-driving cars. I think it's coming. Yeah, it's going to take time. But I think it takes time. So, And by the way, in all these projects, you, you, can't, you can't just make a provision that says, I expect 10 years from today, self-driving cars are going to be here. Therefore, I can reduce my parking counts by 50% because you can't get the approvals to do that. You still have to deal with the municipality and approvals. If you were speaking to a brand right now and that I was the head of a brand uh, that you're trying to get into on your projects, what, what are some of the things that you get frustrated by that you wish people would pay more attention to 
when it comes to dealing with real estate developers, dealing with you who are somewhat different to the average uh, developer, I guess. But where do people get hung up on the brand retail side? Well, what everybody seems to be getting hung up on today are economics. I mean, you, you, this world is turned completely upside down. And what's really a shame, obviously, from my point of view as a developer and owner of these projects, is when you get into negotiations with people who they know and you know, they're coming into a very special location in a project. We've curated and merchandised the project to enhance their success. They know it. They know we're going to deliver 100% of what we're saying. And they're negotiating from a position of going to the lowest common denominator project. So they basically, they've got their most conservative hat on. So they're unwilling to pay the kind of even minimum rents that really are required to help you sustain the economics of a project. So everything today becomes performance. Yeah. Now, fortunately for us, I would say 50% of the tenants that we deal with um, will address that. And so we will be able to get economics that work that allow us to finance a project. But there's no question, we're both betting on the success of what we're delivering. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the world today. So the um, ultimately, the um, this e-commerce question, uh, and I, a mutual friend of ours, Scott Malkin, likes to say that if the future of retail is e-commerce, the future of brand is retail. Um, you... Um, have a similar philosophy, which is that, you know, the placemaking, this brings this full circle a little bit, the placemaking initiative, all of the activations that go into bringing not just the people, but making that that expressive nature of the project so appealing that they leave with a brand equity enhancing right. uh, memory yeah. uh, for those brands who are there. Give Give us your sort of structural view on how important for brand building the right kind of retail is. So it, it comes back to a whole compositional experience, right? Because it's it's not any one thing. It's the right composition and combination of all the things you do that somehow just get it right. People say to me all the time, why are you spending all this time and effort in the restaurant business? And it's because, and you just experienced my new wine spectator club. I did. At uh, 35 Hudson Yards. It's beautiful. So... That may be the best example of this microcosm of why I love this business, that part of the business, because you're given a space, you're in a good location, a great location, but think how many people would come up with very different solutions for how to use that space and what it would look like. So it's the very special ability to have the taste level and the vision and the commitment to executing something from an operating point of view that, and, and having a, an architect like David Rockwell but I, David's been there, by the way, four times in the last five days for dinner. He went there again last night. But I think David would tell you, you know, the difference is the client. And if you've got the right chemistry with the right client doing the right thing, it's amazing what you can do. And it doesn't happen many times. Mm-hmm. Think of the places you go into. Um, it's what, what happens, I think, when people arrive at Hudson Yards and they go into this great room and they haven't been there before and they start to move through the project, even if they can't articulate it. There's something about the quality of what's in that space, the way it's designed, the way Howard and I did it, the the, the escalators, which are almost entertainment driven mm-hmm. um, as you're in the middle of the project, the quality of the materials and the content and the merchandising and the restaurants and Mercado. I mean, all the things that sort of bring it all together. Now, in Santa Clara, we mentioned this a little earlier, I mean, we will be developing remote merchandising units and we're developing what's called pavilion buildings. So pavilion buildings are literally built around the character of a retailer, and they're only 1,500 to 3,500 square feet. And our public realm, which is made up of almost 20 acres of the whole site, will be filled with all these great pavilion buildings. Hmm. And by the way, our inspiration for all that really came from spending weeks and weeks with the foster teams in London. As we went to the parks, we went to the small public pocket parks, and we went to a number of projects that were small in scale, but beautifully executed and great materials. And when you see this, there's an architect in California I'll give credit to by the name of Howard Backen. And Howard Backen and I've worked together for years. He did all the original Williams Sonoma stores and has done a lot of work for Restoration Hardware, Gary Friedman, mm-hmm. who's a genius in his business. Mm-hmm. And Howard's taste level. You built him a building in um, Palm Beach, in right? In Palm Beach, that's right. Uh, Restoration Hardware uh, Mansion. 
Anyway, Howard Backen does all the beautiful homes in Napa and Sonoma and does many of the vineyards, all right? So it's all about stone fireplaces and beautiful woods and, uh, and great stone materials. Feels Northern California. When you see the project I'm doing in Santa Clara, that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's wonderful. And so to, let's end on where we started on, on restaurants. Um, are any restaurants that you have been to that you do not own that have given you uh, pause to refer them on to friends, what, what, whether it be New York, London, San Francisco, anything, anything uh, that you've been talking about? Well, because I've been a student of private clubs over the last four years, I've spent a lot of time on the club side of the business. <laughs> yeah. And so London is probably still the best example, right? With um, Annabelle's, Five Hereford, Paul Mall 57, and now Oswald's. So I love... Each of those clubs is a little different. Each of them is really focused on great service and great food, great menus. But there's something special about each of the interiors and the way that they deal with uh, the programming. Mm -hmm. Annabelle's is, of course, the craziest, right? Because it's the biggest and it's got all kinds of entertainment components. But the club I love the most there today is Oswald. And uh, because it's just so tastefully done and the food and the experience are just so great. And that's really, that's really what it's about. Great programming, great service. I think yep. it's a good place to yep. good place to end. Ken, thank you so much for doing the safari with me. Happy to be here. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io, where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it.